Now let's go on to a study of lock implementations. If you think back to lecture 10, we talked about various kinds of synchronization. One kind was wait and post operations, which we used in, let's say, do pipe or, or do across. And there's also send and receive, which we use in message passing. These are called point-to-point -point synchronizations because uh, one process gets to one point and waits for another process to get to the, another point. There is also lock synchronization in which uh, you enter a critical section by setting a lock and then once you get done with the critical section you leave the lock. And then there's barrier synchronization which requires a certain number of threads to get to a given point before any thread can proceed beyond that point. Now all of these need to be implemented with some kind of underlying lock, ultimately with a hardware lock. Lock implementations vary quite considerably, but if we want a good one, we should have it meet four requirements. First of all, the uncontended latency should be low, and that means that if there is no, but no contention, that is only one thread is trying to enter the lock, it shouldn't take very long to, to acquire the lock. And then there's traffic. You don't want to have a situation where uh, threads that are waiting to get in keep beating on memory and invalidating each other's cache lines and causing all kinds of contention on the bus and to memory, etc. So we want lock acquisition, when the lock is already locked, to be pretty cheap. We don't want to have a lot of traffic then. And certainly when the lock is free, we don't expect a lot of traffic when we try to set the lock and that it shouldn't take very long to release a lock. There shouldn't be many memory references involved, for example. Another metric is fairness. And fairness just says that everybody who's waiting for the lock should have about an equal chance of getting in. And if anybody's favored, that should be the thread that's been waiting longer. And then there's storage. You know, if you want every thread, if you want lots and lots of threads to use a single lock variable, there will be a lot of contention for that memory location, and that can be undesirable. And one way of solving that problem is to use lots of memory locations instead of one memory location. But the more memory locations you use, of course, the higher the cost. So you don't want to use lots and lots of memory to set the lock. Now in concurrent programs, as we've seen, it's sometimes necessary to ensure, ensure that only one thread gets into a certain section of the code at one time. And a sort of naive way of doing that is to say, well, let's have an ordinary variable that we'll call a lock, and we'll set its value to zero in the beginning, and then when a thread acquires the lock, it'll set it to one, and when it leaves the lock, it'll set it to zero. So if multiple threads are trying to acquire the lock, then they're all waiting while the lock variable is one, and as soon as it becomes something else, like zero, then they'll be able to exit the while loop and get into the critical section and set the lock variable to one, and then no other thread will be able to get in as long as they're in the critical section. The only problem with this is that any number of threads can be executing while lock var equal one, and it could be that as soon as somebody sets the, th the lock variable to zero, two, three, or more threads just test it right at that moment before any of those threads can set lock variable to one, and then they can all enter the, criti the so-called critical section. So this just won't work. If we want to express that in assembly language, it looks something like this. We load from a location of lock variable into register one, and then we branch if register one, that is the value of lock variable, is not zero. And so we branch back to the lock in that case. And if we don't branch back to the lock, we fall through and set lock variable to one. And now we've returned because we have acquired the lock. When it comes time to unlock the lock, we set the lock variable to zero and then return. So that's the way this code is implemented. And if it were to work, you'd need to have this entire sequence here from the load to the store immediate be executed atomically, which means that nobody else can get in while all three of these instructions are executing. So we're, that's not the case, of course, with these ordinary instructions. We'll talk a little bit later about instructions that do have that property. But for now, let's also note that multiple sequences, in other words, if you have multiple threads that are trying to get into the lock, that they are serialized. So one can execute and then the next one executes and so forth, but they can't be executing at the same time. Now, as I said, 
Ordinary memory operations don't fill the bill of being atomic. That is to say, when you read a value of a memory location, you can't write the value of the memory location until you execute another instruction. But by the time you execute the other instruction, any other thread could have got in and read that same value. So you've got to read and write atomically. There are several different kinds of instructions that can provide this. Perhaps the most basic is the test and set instruction. The test and set instruction reads a value stored at a location called M and tests it against a constant, usually zero, and if that location matches that constant, it writes the value in register Rx to memory location M. And that value in register Rx is normally one. So if you find the value of this variable set to zero, then you immediately change it to one, and you do so in a way that no other thread can get in and read the value until you've finished setting it. Then there's fetch and op, which works pretty much the same way, except instead of setting the value to a particular value that's in a register, you add a certain value, or you subtract a certain value, or, or whatever. You perform some kind of operation on the value, and read it, and change it to whatever result is returned by the operation, without giving any other thread an opportunity to get in and read the value. Then there is an exchange operation where you swap the value in memory, swap a value in a memory location with a value in a register, and you do that atomically so that the old value of the register gets into memory and the old value of memory gets into the register with no intervening operations. The final kind is compare and swap, where you compare a value in a memory location with a value in a register, let's call it Rx. If these two values match, you write the value in another register to M and copy the value in Rx to Ry. So the way to read that is if the value in the memory location matches the value in register Rx, then Ry, the old value of Rx goes to M, the old value of Rx goes to Ry. Okay, so all of these instructions perform operations atomically. How do they do that? Well, on a bus-based system, you can do that by simply reserving the bus until you're done. Normally, we were thinking of having a single memory operation go across the bus at a time. So as soon as you finish your read or write, the bus is released. But if you have an instruction that holds on to the bus between the read and the ensuing write, then you've got an atomic instruction. Another way of doing it, if you don't have a bus, is to reserve a cache block until you're done. So you want to do a, perform an operation on a particular location, a particular variable, let's say, that's cached. You reserve that cache block. You get exclusive permission, for example, by changing the state to M. And then if anybody tries to invalidate or, or in, intervene, in other words, to change it back to an S, in the meantime, you just delay any uh, such requests or, or knack them, you know, just say try again later. And you make sure you hold on to the cache block until the new value is written to the cache location. A third way of solving the problem is to provide the illusion of atomicity, which means to uh, do something as if the instruction were atomic, and then if later on you find out that somebody got into that memory location before you change its value, just come back and try again. So that's, that's kind of the illusion of atomicity, and that's provided by the load link and store conditional operation, which we'll talk about in a couple of videos from now. So what we've done is set the stage for talking about locks by talking about the requirements for, a, um, for an effective lock, the kinds of instructions you can use to ensure atomic accesses to memory, to, to atomic reads and writes.